tell you a story, an all too common story, an all too tragic story, about someone who might come to Austin Riggs or end up in any of the offices of psychiatrists and psychotherapists around the world. Imagine a boy, third or fourth grade, who has trouble sitting still, fidgeting. Maybe he's like some of you in the audience right now. Gets sent to the principal and then to the counselor's office. Turns out this boy's got some difficult things going on at home. His parents are fighting. There's an illness in one of his siblings. But the teachers have to do their job. They have to get him to sit still and listen to the lesson. So he gets sent to a therapist, maybe a psychiatrist, to diagnose him with something we all know about called ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. He may improve somewhat, get put on a medication, get some therapy for that. Flash forward several years now, for that same young man, now a teenager. He's in high school, gets into the wrong crowd, starts using alcohol and drugs. Again, gets sent to a counselor. He's lucky, actually, to a therapist or a psychiatrist who gives him another diagnosis, the diagnosis of substance abuse disorder, maybe alcoholism, or maybe something else. Boy gets some help, goes back to high school, but now it's time for graduation. His classmates are moving out going off to college, getting jobs. He struggles. He has a job briefly, sleeps late on more than one occasion, loses his job, ends up staying in bed for much longer than is good for him, plays video games during the day rather than going out and socializing. His friends aren't in town anyway. Again, he gets sent to some kind of counselor or therapist, and this time the diagnosis may be depression, or maybe he gets referred to as having an anxiety disorder. A few more years go on, and his life doesn't improve. He starts to self-injure. He cuts himself. And after one particularly bad breakup with a girlfriend, he threatens to commit suicide, and again, luckily, ends up in the hospital rather than going through on it. He gets yet another set of diagnoses, is told that he has bipolar disorder or borderline personality disorder. Now, this is not the exception that I'm describing, unfortunately. This is how the diagnoses in our field have developed over time. That it's surprisingly easy to end up with five or even six diagnoses that I just described in one individual with one set of problems. A quarter of Americans will get diagnosed with a psychiatric disorder at some time in their lives, and the majority of those will get more than one diagnosis. So what does this mean about our field? What does it mean? that someone can have so many different labels associated with them. I'm not here to criticize those labels. In fact, each and every one of them is given by someone caring in order to facilitate, in their minds, some kind of treatment. But there's a truth in there that I think we speak to all too infrequently in the field. And that is where we are in the fields of psychiatry and psychology, is that we're describing symptoms. We're describing how somebody feels how somebody presents, whether they're depressed, whether they're anxious, whether they're abusing substances. What we haven't been able to describe yet is what the underlying causes are. Let me make an analogy to medical illnesses to make this clear. Imagine that instead of describing someone who's having an appendicitis, we describe someone as having abdominal pain, fever, nausea, all very real, all very important symptoms. But each one doesn't specify the full illness. In fact, there's multiple reasons one could have fever, nausea, or abdominal pain. But put together in a certain way with a certain type of abdominal pain, and you have appendicitis. So that diagnosis is not just a symptom. In fact, it gets to something that in medicine we refer to as pathophysiology, a word that means we understand what the underlying problem is. We know that the appendix is inflamed, infected, and it also, in most cases, refers to a potential treatment. We know that the way to treat an appendicitis is to remove the appendix, an appendectomy. So by identifying the underlying cause and not referring to it as a series of symptoms, as important as those are, we set ourselves up to treat and to heal. Another example of this would be pneumonia. Pneumonia involves a cough, but we don't refer to it as a cough. We refer to it by its underlying name, pneumonia. What you might not know is the history of medicine is filled with examples where we refer to things initially by their symptoms 
because that's what we knew. Famous example of this is a disorder that used to be known called dropsy, or hydropsy was the full name. And what it meant was an accumulation of fluid in the limbs or the abdomen, what today we usually refer to as edema. Now you may know there's many reasons one can have an accumulation of fluid. For example, one very important reason would be heart failure. But another could be a problem with the kidneys, or even another could be some kind of a cancer that's impairing the body's ability to resorb water. But we don't refer to it as dropsy anymore because we have those other names and we understand the underlying pathophysiology and therefore we can call it heart disease or kidney disease or cancer. This is where we are in psychiatry today and psychology. We are on the brink of being able to describe disorders by their pathophysiology, not merely by their symptoms. Now, that's not an easy task. And in order to get there, we have some tough things to understand. So let me start with one. This is a normal distribution curve or bell curve. Many of you may have learned about this in high school or college. What does a bell curve tell us? What it tells us is that average things happen more frequently than things at the extreme. So if we imagine that to be higher on this curve means more people have that particular trait or symptom, and to be off to the right side or to the left side is to suggest that fewer people, lower, have more extremes. Many, many natural phenomena are described in this way. Height, weight, for example. Most people are somewhere in the middle, and then some people, fewer, are higher, and fewer are, are lower. Well, it turns out that virtually every one of the psychiatric symptoms that we talk about, depression, anxiety, substance abuse, when measured, lie along a bell curve. And what that tells you is that rather than falling neatly into groups of those who have the problem and those who don't, we're actually describing something very human, that we all are depressed sometimes, that we all are anxious sometimes, that there are fewer of us who have more and fewer who have less. So what we are doing in most of contemporary psychiatry nowadays is drawing a vertical line on this chart and saying, well, you have more than a certain amount, we're going to refer to that as a diagnosis, depression, anxiety, and so on. And if you have less than that, we're going to refer to you as not having a diagnosis. We're dichotomizing something that is not intrinsically dichotomized. And we do that for an important reason. We have to make decisions about who to give treatments to and who to fund for other treatments. But we, we can't lose sight of the fact that right now, that is what we're describing. By the way, this is true of, of attentional disorders as well. As much as it may seem that there are children who fit neatly into the category of ADHD or not, in fact, attentional disorders lie along this continuum. So where do we need to go? We need to move to a graph like this. We need to be able to identify different aspects, again, pathophysiology of the mind, the brain, that allow us to, as Plato said, carve nature up by its joints to separate things out in a way that actually makes intrinsic sense. Let me give you the medical example. If we asked a group of people to describe some aspect of abdominal pain, most people have some abdominal pain. They fall somewhere in the middle. Much greater pain would be off to one side, and lucky people who have no abdominal pain ever at all would be off to the other side. And that would look like a normal distribution. And if we refined our question though, and instead of just asking about abdominal pain, we did an x-ray or CAT scan of the appendix, and we saw in how many people is the appendix inflamed, it would look more like this. That is, we would see a smaller subgroup that had inflamed appendices, and we know what the treatment is for that, and a larger group that doesn't. This is where we need to go in psychology and psychiatry. But getting there is pretty tricky. There are three parts that we have to accomplish, and I'm happy to say that I think these are happening in the coming decade or two. First, we have to understand something about underlying vulnerabilities. As much as we would like it to be true that we are all born exactly the same and everybody has the opportunity to be as healthy as the next, we also know from many genetic analyses that this is not true. We each come into the world with vulnerabilities that we inherit from our genome. 
Amazingly, we now have the capacity to read out that genome for a relatively reasonable amount of money. We can spend about $1,000 now to read out the totality of someone's genome, a project that only 20 years ago would cost billions, the famous Human Genome Project, which set the stage for current technologies. That means that we have the ability to read this code. We don't yet know what the code means, but gives us the opportunity to understand that within that code, where are the vulnerabilities that will make certain individuals more likely to develop certain disorders in certain environmental contexts. So that's number one. Number two, we need to understand the pathophysiology of the mind and the brain. That's the organ. It's the most complicated organ in the body, and it's the one we know the least about. But we're developing technologies that allow us to understand how the brain works in health and in illness. The most important of those new technologies is something you're probably familiar with, MRI, or magnetic resonance imaging. That same technology that can be used to get those incredibly beautiful pictures of one's knee or one's shoulder can also be used to get a picture of the brain. And this is relatively new technology, been around for about 20 years. And we're making rapid progress. Just in the last couple of years, a major government effort that was inspired by the Human, Human Genome Project, this project called the Human Connectome Project, gathered data on over a thousand individuals, healthy individuals, to understand the way the brain is structured, the way it functions, and even the way different parts of the brain are connected. The image I have above me is of something called diffusion tensor imaging, or DTI. What it looks at is the pathways, the wires that connect different parts of the brain that can process it. And colors are used to illustrate the direction of those wires. So really, for the first time, we're able to apply technologies like this in an experimental, research-oriented way to individuals and look at the differences and the similarities between them. That's truly revolutionary and will give us, I believe, the opportunity to start to identify which regions of the brain and how they're connected affect individuals. We're not there yet. We can't use MRIs today to diagnose or to treat mental illness, but we're getting there. We can't get too distracted by these technologies, the excitement of the Human Genome Project, the excitement of the Human Connectome Project, to forget that where we are now and still need to understand the stories of our patients, just like that boy and young man I described to you at the beginning of this talk. It's not enough to say that he's depressed, he's anxious, he has a substance abuse problem. We need the full story, what we at Austin Riggs often refer to as the deep story. What's happening? The symptoms for sure. Also, what the symptoms mean to him. What did it mean that he was left behind when his friends went off to college or had jobs? What does it mean that he's depressed or using substances or even later on cutting himself? These meanings are key. We must match them up to those things that we learn in neuroscience as well as in genetics. If we do that, the future is bright.